Hello and welcome everyone um, for this uh, panel discussion entitled the ESG for Global Financial Markets. Uh, this session is held as part of this year's edition of the Colaba Conversation, which as you know is hosted by the Observer Research Foundation and the government of Maharashtra in India under the theme Navigating Fault Lines to Recovery. Uh, my name is Gabriel Eliotta, I'm a fellow at the World Economic Forum and I'm a public policy lead for the Stakeholder Capitalism Metrics Initiative. Uh, joining me here today, we have a group of very distinguished speakers who I know um, we uh, now have the pleasure to uh, briefly introduce. So first on my screen is uh, Mr. Girish Joshi, who is uh, the Chief Trading Operation and Listing, Listing Sales at the Bombay Stock Exchange, BSC. Welcome, uh, Girish. Next, I have uh, Dr. Claude Lopez, who is the Head of Research at the Milken Institute. Uh, welcome, Claude. Um, then Professor Lucrezia Reichlin, who is the full professor of economics at the London Business School, as well as a trustee of the International Financial Reporting Standards IFRS Foundation. Welcome, Professor. And last but not least, Tejinder Singh, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, um, IOSCO. So before I turn to all of you to begin the conversation, let me just briefly um, frame the discussion for, for today, the ESG imperative for global financial markets. Now, as you know, the context in which businesses now operate has been transformed by, by climate change, by natural loss, by inequality over a lack of uh, economic opportunities, obviously COVID-19, and the changing expectations around the role of corporations. Now, to continue to thrive, companies need to build resilience, uh, li enhance their license to operate, and really commit to long-term sustainable value creation that embrace demands of uh, the people and planet. In capital markets worldwide, there is a recognition that environmental, social, and governance aspects are uh, key for both risk management, but also for enterprise value creation. Investors are turning uh, their attention to ESG factors uh, in a significant and growing way. There are economic opportunities, but there's also pressure from both governments and society on companies to deal with uh, a number of the systemic issues like climate change, for instance, we're just uh, off of a uh, very intense few weeks at COP26 uh, Glasgow. So today's conversation is really an opportunity to get a better understanding of how capital market art actors are looking at ESG factors to channel investment flows, what are some of the key obstacles and what can be done to um, overcome them. So without further ado, let me turn to Mr. Girish Joshi first, really to ask from your vantage point, how do you see the overall growth of uh, ESG, uh, ESG investing in capital markets, in India specifically, and what opportunities do you see for investors and companies in the ESG uh, space and the role of uh, BSC in this, uh, in this environment? Yeah. Over to yeah. you, Yeah. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, yeah, as you rightly uh, started, no? ESG is a theme, buzzword, not a buzzword, but it is a must now for every investor, every stakeholder, when they commit the funds and resources for whether investment activity or lending activity. And I think trend is clearly apparent if you look at the Global Sustainable Investor Association data, which all of we track the data which comes every two years. So the assets, ESG assets has increased too much, means 22.8 trillion US dollar uh, in 2016 to it has gone to 35 uh, USD trillion dollar and of that and, and of course uh, Europe is the leader uh, now even US is also contributing more than 50 percent uh, around 50 per 17 USD trillion dollar so ES is paying popularity and if you look at the asset class even debt which was a uh, three uh, USD trillion dollar it has now you know, likely to cross 11 trillion dollar and the Bloomberg has also stated in a recent uh, one of the study that uh, total assets and for ESG tracking would exceed easily 50 trillion dollar and the more important aspects when you look at the stock market is ESG ETF they're likely to draw the fund around you no know, USD 1 trillion dollar so this is on the global side from when you look at Europe and Asia okay, uh, Europe and uh, USA when you look at the Asia of course there is also increase in the investments uh, ESG uh, assets AUM which has almost touched, uh, I would say, 11.4 billion US dollar as of 2020, which was hardly in the million couple of years back. And uh, because of COVID and pandemic, I think uh, more and more institutional investors from Asia has also uh, become very conscious and they are adopting ESG theme in their investment analysis and risk metrics. Now coming specific to India, 
India, of course, investments uh, AUG and uh, ESG AU AM has increased many uh, almost four times in last two year. It has uh, all and uh, in the our financial year 2021, USD 510 million uh, dollar inflow has come in India for you know, uh, ESG investment things or ESG EAUs. So it is a uh, very heartening that in India also investors are uh, tracking ESG is a thing. And even Morgan Stanley uh, MSI, so MSI also has done some investment survey and they have brought the data that 57% of investment managers also look at going to look at the ESG theme in their investment evaluation. So in this aspect, a uh, lot of challenges uh, for companies from Asia and for uh, India that uh, you aspire to the requirements of investors and all stakeholders to do better ESG compliant reporting. So you get very sticky uh, investment flow not uh, i'll say volatile investment flow which is beneficial to the uh, companies for long-term investment and even uh, strategic planning so i think i would now take a pause here and may look for subsequent question thank you thank you very much Girish. if i could turn uh, to to uh, claude now um again we're seeing this uh, this uh, increasing uh, volumes of esg investings but um, we also know that there is a number of, of challenges re re related to that, particularly around the, the quality and the comparability of, of ESG data and information that both investors and other stakeholders uh, uh, use. Um, what do you see as sort of the key obstacles that you, you, you observed in this space? Thank you, Gabriel. So, yeah, regarding ESG, we just saw that there is a strong increase in appetite from the investors and even from the firm because, you know, it's, it's part of uh, a societal push. However, we still don't have any clear um, description or way of making sure that the investment belongs to this E, S, and G. Few of the issues that we see, and it's not uh, only the research that we do at the Milken, there is more and more work that shows a lack of comparison uh, whenever you talk to a firm and its assessment uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, its ESG performance, um, assessment done usually by some of the uh, rating agencies or some individual assessments. So um, then it's become extremely difficult to few things. Number one, uh, understanding what ESG is. Uh, whenever you, you see more and more of the discussion happening out there, there is a misunderstanding of what ESG is because it's supposed to be risk management within a firm, just anticipating same way that you had financial risk, anticipating non-financial risk. And the way it has been used or, or communicated on, uh, implying that automatically there will be something good for us or, or good for sustainability, which could be things that can be leaked, but they need to be on purpose. So uh, beyond just a strategy of communication, right now companies are being rewarded by just contributing or claiming that they're doing something in that field. Uh, they need to be a set of uh, clear identification of the goals to make sure that we know what we're talking about. Number one. Number two, uh, once you have that, then you, of course, need to uh, back paddle and identify what will be the different variable. Uh, and that could be industry specific or also regional or country specific because the differences need to be accounted for as the goal is really to uh, help for, for, for growth and not just to have a very one sided from one part of the world way of assessing what the future should look like. And set of criteria uh, that could uh, allow a company to attract more investors just because it's more timely. And, uh, uh, and, and so once you have that, then you can bring accountability because you can truly assess progress toward a well-defined direction. And all those things so far are quite missing or there is a lack also of, you talked about fragmentation across the jurisdiction. We see that there is a lot of effort and my understanding, we're gonna hear more regarding what's happening in, in part of the world, but what uh, uh, you see um, even in the US, whenever you talk with a company, many of them, the big question is, um, okay, which dimension, and can you please give me a roadmap so then I know how to implement it, I can choose which dimension I really want to improve depending on my core business and also the type of investor I'm trying to attract and what I can do. Which leads me to uh, uh, another point which is less and less discussed, but E, S, and G are three different uh, dimensions. There's a lot of work done in environmental, specific, specifically climate change. But whenever we talk about indices, whenever we talk about ESG investment, automatically there is some type of 
aggregation of the information and it's not clear whenever we go then to the standard way for normal investor to assess a company and usually that's when you rely on uh, uh, rating agencies then there need to be a clear uh, transparency regarding what is assessed which dimension for that type of company or for that type of industry or whether it's E, S, and G, and what the progress look like. So they also need to be more and more effort once you have an understanding of the goals that you're trying to achieve to really show that environment, uh, uh, governance, and, and, and social may not become, and you may be improving in one dimension and not the other. So right now, while it's a very interesting discussion and you push in the right direction, the lack of clarity, clarification regarding the goals that you're trying to achieve and how can you achieve them, uh, um, 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 is uh, maybe the main challenges to make sure that this momentum becomes something real in all the different dimensions. Uh, finally, my last point, all that discussion, and I see we see a lot of effort uh, need to happen at the G20 level, of course, but also it has to be a private and public partnership. Uh, firm no, should not be feel sanctioned, but they should feel like it's an incentive for them to manage properly uh, their risk and to grow. Uh, um, the biggest uh, uh, issue would be to have a very strong uh, monitoring that uh, creates a disconnect with them and, 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 and really work against, um, you know, the other thing that you're supposed to be doing, such as creating growth, creating growth and, and, and jobs and, and things like that. I think I'm going to stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Claude. Um, so you have obviously identified a number of challenges um, there uh, in a number of areas. If I could turn uh, to, to Lucrezia now, um, obviously you as a, both a professor and in your, your capacity as a trustee of the FRS Foundation uh, have, uh, have looked into these issues. Um, IFRS standards are the basis for accounting standards in a number of uh, countries, uh, including, including India. Uh, when it comes to, to this remit of ESG, how, how have you looked into, the, into some of these challenges? Uh, if you could tell us more about the uh, role that um, the FS Foundation will play there. Yes, uh, thank you, Gabriele. Um, yes, I mean, I think there is, uh, I mean, there has been progress uh, and uh, actually a good news because uh, you probably have seen that at COP26, our chair, Erkili Cannon, has announced the establishment of a new board of standard setting, the International Sustainability Standard Board, which will operate under the umbrella of the IFRS Foundation. And will be its mission will be to issue standards for starting with climate, but then broadening up later. Uh, you know, sustainability matters. Now, this step of having an institution like the IFRS, which has the credibility as a standard setter for what concerns financial accounts, uh, uh, so this step is, uh, is, is very uh, important because I think it's the first condition for going for what has been called the alphabet soup, so a situation that also Claude described of many standards, often contradictory, and uh, non-comparable, and uh, so to go from that situation to a situation of uh, you know higher coherence and comparability, and also for to go from recommendations to actually mandatory standards, which could be auditable and uh, you know assurable and auditable standards. This is very important in my view because without that we are going to get greenwashing. We know that there is underreporting today, so many companies through are, are you know have pledged you know to to join this uh, um, sustainability campaign if you want, but we know that there is still very few companies that that uh, are reporting. And, uh, and, you know, frankly, the, the business sector has uh, asked for, you know, clarification and uh, cleaning up this landscape. So I think this is going to be very significant. The FRS has the credibility also in terms of due process and global outreach. Uh, so it has been important that uh, the FRS has been the consolidator of other initiatives which were around. So I think this is actually, if I can make this point, has been a very interesting experiment uh, as an institutional build-up. In less than two years, we have uh, built a new piece of the international infrastructure, financial infrastructure. And this has been possible because we have combined 
the vision of uh, you know the pioneers in this field and here i want to you know cite the the SASB, the Value Reporting Foundation, the IRC, the CDSB, all these organizations, which, uh, you know, 20 years ago, they seen that that was going to be important to have reporting in this area. So we combine, uh, you know, this pioneer work with, you know, our institutional credibility and legitimacy, as you know, the FRS uh, uh, as a three-tier structure with the monitoring board on top of it, in which the security regulators sit, and this, you know, gives the public accountability that uh, you know standard setters need. So this is a hybrid organization which combines private sectors and uh, public sector oversight. Um, which uh, I think that if you want that, uh, you know, public-private um, collaboration that Claude was talking about, is the right setup, you know, to make progress. So I'm quite optimistic. I will be able to talk more about it maybe in the second round, but uh, I think that that's, I want us to emphasize that this has been a key announcement in Glasgow, and uh, I think uh, which creates a discontinuity with respect to the past. So we have to be optimistic. Thank you, Lucrezia. And indeed, this is good news because we are seeing, as you said, a, an, an added piece of global governance and institutional building at a time where you have uh, such dynamics that need to be uh, governed. Uh, and indeed, I guess uh, if I could turn to uh, Tejinder Singh now. Uh, Tejinder, obviously, as you represent um, a, a number of securities commissions and regulators. You obviously looked at this issue, looked at the developments of a standard setting entity uh, entering into this remit. Um, what is the role of IOSCO? How you've been uh, um, acting in this space now? Um, thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. And, and let me also uh, start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this Collaba Conversation 2021. It reminds me of my time back in India, in Mumbai, actually. So with that, uh, I should say uh, very much that. So so what, what has been the issue so far? I think Lucrezia touched, uh, touched upon that and so did the other speakers, that you need trillions of dollars of private capital in order to achieve the sustainable development goals and of course in order to to achieve net zero targets and therefore the good news has been that there has been a flood of investment into esg and broader sustainability related products so what has been the problem look as you mentioned the alphabet soup the variety of sustainability reporting frameworks and standards and that has resulted in sustainability reporting that is incomplete and inconsistent across jurisdictions now, what does that do? It impairs the ability of investors to make informed decisions and raises concerns around mispricing of assets and gives rise to risks of greenwashing. That is where securities regulators come in because the moment investors' interests are, are affected, investor protection is affected, securities regulators come in. Uh, and, and clearly, trust in the markets is needed for sustainable finance to work at scale. Now, what are these core elements of this trust? So I would say, I was talking about the level of investors. You need the, the investors to have the correct information so that we can achieve the goals of investor protection. But also, at the broader level of markets, you need market integrity. And then from a macro perspective, we also know that some of these things, especially climate change and the risks that come from that, can actually give rise to financial stability. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that these three goals, Investor protection, market integrity, and financial stability are the objectives of securities regulation, are the objectives of my organization, IOSCO. And therefore, that is the reason to your question, Gabriele, why is it that securities regulators are involved or interested? That is the reason. Now, we have worked in three key areas. Clearly, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Lucrezia had mentioned, sustainability disclosure, where we have worked with the IFRS Foundation, but also we have worked on greenwashing and asset manager disclosures and practices, as well as ESG ratings and data providers. Now, what is the key theme that has been running through them, through all these three work streams? That key theme is that of complete and consistent information, because asset managers, as well as ESG ratings and data providers also need accurate ESG data for their portfolios and ratings. Now, our work in terms of uh, the, the work that we've done with the IFRS Foundation, we have encouraged the IFRS Foundation to make progress towards launching the IWSB. 
uh, focused on enterprise value creation and moving forward quickly with a climate first approach. And we are all delighted to, we were all delighted to, to have those announcements come from Glasgow, from COP26. And Lucrezia here was uh, characteristically understated by saying, yes, we've made some progress. I think this has been a lot of progress. Uh, and now, before that happened, in June, IOSCO had published a report that had pointed out the gaps and inconsistencies that were there and are there still, but also the solution via the IFRS, uh, the International Sustainability Standards Board. And for that, what did we do? We learned from what we had done with the IASP setting up 20 years ago, which, as Lucrezia again says rightly, has built up a reputation over two decades of setting international standards for global markets that have been adopted in over 140 jurisdictions. And so I think what are the key elements for us as securities regulators, there are two key elements. One is content and the second is governance. So in terms of content, we what we want is content that is fit for purpose and that is technically relevant to securities regulators. And how are we getting there? There has been a strong IOSCO IFRS collaboration as well as the collaboration with the voluntary reporting frameworks to develop content that meets what investors and policymakers need. And the method that Lopezia also mentioned through the coming together of these bodies that she named the voluntary, the, the VRF, the SASP, CDP, CDSP, I think that has actually been, that is providing the running start in terms of using the best of breed frameworks that incorporates expertise and proven content from the most widely adopted frameworks and standards out there. And therefore, the alphabet soup is actually getting replaced by the, the, the IWSB and the IFRS umbrella. I think it is absolutely crucial to say that, you know, to not mix up the alphabet soup issue, which, you know, sometimes people confuse and say, well, you know, you've had all of these and the IFRS is yet another, you know, element of the alphabet soup. It is not. And for that, I think it is important to recognize that there was another significant announcement besides the setting up of the IWSB, and that might have gone a little bit unnoticed, relatively speaking, which is that there, has, there is a consolidation happening in terms of the Voluntary Reporting Foundation, which itself is the SASB plus the Integrated Reporting Council, the International Report, Integrated Reporting Council, as well as the CDSB. So you're already seeing a merger happening uh, which is actually then getting, you know, it, it is thinning down the alphabet soup. It is concentrating it into the substance that we need. So it is crucial to note that this is probably, I haven't seen many cases where you've had all this plethora of things and that they are voluntarily coming together and saying, yes, in the public interest, we subsume ourselves under the broader public interest that comes from the IFRS umbrella with the involvement of securities regulators. And so that is on content, on governance. Uh, again, there we, we believe that we can have a robust process because that will have multiple layers of checks and balances in terms of the standard setting between the private sector and public sector oversight. I'm repeating the point about the, you know, the, uh, the private public collaboration and with the participation of securities regulators who are, after all, the authorities responsible for the supervision of proper functioning of capital markets. And this, uh, this, this uh, robustness happens through the standard setting due process, the consultation, the multi-stakeholder approach, and the public interest oversight through the well-established three-tier governance structure that Lucrezia mentioned, and, and where you have the monitoring board that is chaired by IOSCO at the top. Let me quickly mention two key interoperabilities. So um, the first one is where that IOSCO has encouraged the IFRS Foundation to also set up mechanisms for interoperability with regard to requirements that capture wider sustainability impacts. We have these questions about the double pillar and so on. And we think that we can actually, you know, have, have a very, very good way of filtering, of getting what we need for standard setting through a consultative mechanism and that the IFRS Foundation is already making strides in progressing. The second interoperability is the interoperability with jurisdictions themselves. After all, this is a global baseline and then jurisdictions themselves across the world will need to adopt the global baseline um, to the extent that it is consistent with their own regulatory framework so that we can promote consistency and comparability. And here again, the, the game changer can be 
a possible IOSCO endorsement of the standard when it comes out uh, in around the second half of next year on climate, building on the climate prototype that has been developed so far, that can be a game changer as it was for the IASB going forward. So I think with that, let me mention uh, a few other points. Uh, assurance will be an important element going forward uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the uptake of the standards and their credibility. Also, I should all mention the work that we have done apart from reporting on asset managers and greenwashing. And we will next week be publishing our final report on ESG ratings and data providers. And why have we done that? That is because both uh, the asset managers, they, they struggled to describe accurately how they manage climate risks at both firm and portfolio levels. And ESG ratings are currently hampered by subjectivity, transparency issues, and serious inconsistencies. However, the key point is that these expectations can only be fully realized if we achieve the quality of real economy corporate sustainability disclosures of the type envisaged by the IWSB. And therefore, we think the IWSB standards will enable the whole range of climate finance professionals from fund managers to ESG rating firms besides investors to raise their game in order that the end investors have the justified confidence in the products offered and information supplied to them. To close, let me mention that this is not the end of the road. This is you know, almost the start of the journey and IOSCO will continue to work with its members who together regulate more than 95% of the world's capital markets. We will be looking at the endorsement of the standard, a possible endorsement of the standard uh, that uh, the IWSB will, uh, will seek to come out with next year. But we will also continue to help our members in terms of supervisory guidance because these are standards that will be then become regulations and then you have to supervise against these regulations and therefore we will also be building capacity for our emerging market members but also many other members and we have already had a, a, a successful event with the UN with UNCTAD last month on this area so that is essentially where securities regulators are coming from and back to your government. Thank you, Tejinder. So clearly uh, a logical role for, for IOSCO and the securities regulators there, a proactive approach towards more robust uh, um, type of uh, information in the markets. Let me just, uh, if I could summarize this, this first round very quickly, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, clearly uh, increased ESG investing interest and demand for uh, the right information and better quality information. We discussed a number of obstacles around uh, accessing this information and having a um, comparable and consistent uh, data. Regulators uh, coming in to provide the more robust infrastructure and obviously uh, a major standard setter entity with uh, the credibility uh, stepping in in this process. So if I could then turn uh, back to Girish, I guess, um, uh, while all this institutional process unfolds, uh, companies have to get on with business now. Uh, so I would be uh, interested to hear specifically in India and uh, in the context of your stock exchange, BSC, uh, what role is BSC playing to provide guidance uh, to companies as this global standards uh, you know, process unfolds? Uh, what role is the Indian regulator, SEBI, uh, playing in all, in all of these? And what um, uh, suggestions and, and, and recommendations you would give to both investors and companies in the BSC space uh, in India that want to tap to these opportunities? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I guess we go to the little bit uh, more uh, go into the past. Like all this uh, you know, development has started parallelly in the European market because Europe was the first driver for this ESG compliant reporting by the company. So even the uh, Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, which was started by UN, UN so BSC was the first exchange in 2012, which signed that you know mandate with Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. And parallelly, we introduced two indices in 2012, long back, you know, SNP BAC Green X. And later on, we also introduced another indice, SNP BAC Carbon X. So we introduced two products on that time, 2013 14. And later on, also, uh, we have recently introduced SNP BAC ESG Index. So these are the products we have launched that so at least companies uh, get inclined to do better ESG reporting. And so they get uh, you know, upliftment and they get included in the index. Also, uh, like um, uh, you know, Singh also said, no standards. So GRI was the first agency from the Europe which was you know, encouraging companies to do better ESG reporting. So we did uh, tie up with the, uh, GRI and uh, we started doing awareness program with our listed companies to do you know, better ESG reporting and also do through GRI portal. 
so more than 100 companies also doing uh, reporting from india so that's the thing parallel we started and our regulator now our as mr singh said all regulators across the globe are also pushing so our regulator uh, sebi also mandated in 2015 that top 100 companies should do business responsibility reporting and now recently they have enhanced the reporting of business reporting as a business reporting and sustainable reporting brsa reporting which has also been mandated at top 1000 companies from effective from next year 22 23 so this is on the issuer aspect uh, what they should do but at the same time investors no because investors are also very important as mr singh also said there should be some standard there should be some gentle push on them and that also uh, our regulator has also started our regulator sebi has uh, recently come out with consultation paper that all asset manager no means mutual funds how they should disclose their esg portfolio what are the guidelines what are the principles they should follow so consultation paper is already in the public domain feedback is being awaited so soon i think regulation will also come for the investors also to follow some rule and discipline and to disclose their e portfolio in the public domain so both way it is coming that way uh, i mean i would say the ecosystem is getting built up in india uh, to catch up rapidly fast with the you know, europe and us market in terms of uh, better esg reporting compliance and overall benefit to the planet and entire community so that's all thank you thank you very much uh, girish so clearly uh, there is a, an active uh, role to play there for your stock exchange as well as uh, for the regulators let me just turn to the second uh, round of, of of questions again going back to um cloud Uh, you've uh, we've heard the number of sort of uh, good news and announcements regarding uh, the launch of uh, an international standards uh, sustainability standards board uh, as well as obviously the the regulators uh, providing the right oversight uh, to the process i guess what i would like to ask you is is this um, do you see this as the end of uh, of of this uh, journey is this enough uh, what what other key pieces do you see missing in here and what what would you like to see now as next steps of this process uh it's a very good question i think we all agree those are great news it's uh, you know the right step in the right direction but it's a very complex issue so it's just the beginning of the beginning <laughs> of course because we all agree that the framework is improving uh, there is this desire of international coordination we all agree that there need to be standardization of the data we all agree that you know we need to be monitor and there need to be the right push for move For, for changes to happen in the right direction we still need to have the dis not the discussion but there is a lot of different discussions that need to occur regarding what is that data what are those goals that we are trying to uh, achieve and how are we going to do that and how can we do that in a realistic manner number one number two environment i mean risk assessment based on things that are not financial uh, is quite complex i don't know if it's more or less uh, than a uh, financial thing but you also need to look at whenever you you have a push in one direction you need to um, make sure that you also in your reasoning and in the direction that you're pushing you're accounting for the spillovers so for for a long time we had this discussion of uh, green cars and maybe um, electric cars and now there is a question of what do you do whenever the battery is down so 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 it 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 has to be a very holistic approach so of course we need to make sure that we have all the right platform To, so that discussion happen uh, in a very inclusive manner and here i'm talking about uh, geographically different country different needs public private that means the industry need to be part of it so there whatever guidance or direction we provide is a move towards the right direction not something that will be costlier in the future okay so i still go back to my initial point Uh, which is we need to really make sure we know what we're trying to achieve. It's also very important to communicate that so uh, a broader audience truly understand what the ESG is and the gap that there is between ESG and then sustainability or what the sustainability means in that context. And 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 once there is uh, those type of discussion and and also flexibility in that framework so it can evolve whenever program are going to be evolving. Uh, that 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 that's a will. Uh, is necessary complement to to the, the the current discussion most of the uh, moving forward step have been in uh, the environment uh, dimension and mostly is the climate change because it's an obvious thing that very few people can deny 
Uh, but, you know, there is many other dimensions that matters. And that also leads me to the last step, which is the more forward we're going to go, the more we should be clear regarding the E dimension, the S dimension, and the G, what can be done. This is not a, a package deal. Uh, those are very much well-defined dimension that would be more and more defined. And it's very important whenever, um, uh, whether it's regulator or private sector, uh, are communicating on things to be more and more precise to also educate uh, uh, um, uh, the, the broader audience. And whenever I'm talking about the broader audience is everything and it includes the population because we see that the momentum that we're having right now is just because simultaneously there is a necessity, but also a political will, a social pressure, all those things automatically ensure that things go in one direction, but you need to make sure that that pressure go in the right direction, in a pragmatic manner. They need to be timeline. Uh, um, we have a better understanding of what should we be doing to make sure that the global warming could be slowing down a little bit, but you know, how do you, and this is just an institution, but how do you back paddle to make that long term to, to, to something that is real for a company? So, so, so there is a need of identifying the goals. There is a need of defining the goals that are reachable for a company and how it can, how accountability can be brought in. One uh, another point is regarding the, the assessment that is done, the assessors, so those uh, um, um, rating agencies, and it. While we do have, while I'm all for some standardization of the information, so we understand that we're talking about the same thing. The overall assessment can be different. So the methodology, and we have some report regarding that. If there is a consensus regarding the data, and 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 and, and you know there should be some flexibility, how you treat the data can be also totally different depending on what you define to be the priority. The way we're doing our rating is more on the E, the S, or G, that's fine, as long as there is transparency. At the end, it's very important to, to make sure that the final user, whether it's the investor or the firm itself, trying to identify where there could be improvement that could, you know, how the different strategic uh, um, changes that they're doing um, internally could lead to what type of change in their perception or assessment. So that transparency is key. So here we're not talking about a uniformization and one uh, uh, um, rule fit all. We know it's much more complex, but it's a combination of rigor, uh, uh, um, uh, making sure the accountability, making sure we understand what we're looking at and, and, and we go beyond just, we're doing something to, this is what we're trying to do and let's assess how far we go. And then understanding that it's not one size fits all, it's not an ESG package, there is an ESG S and a G, and depending on what your priorities are, it matters. Um, here we're talking about for private company, but there is also here in the US where there will be a lot of infrastructure investment, you know that, and most of them are funded at the state level, so you have those mini funds, there is also pressure for ESG mini funds. At this level, then automatically you know that it's an entire different type of strategy for the local government, depending on how they can declare themselves. So it, 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 uh, um, it is just the beginning because it's an evolution. And wherever we're going to push investment, we trigger all the change, and we absolutely need to account for that. So uh, this really uh, extremely good momentum with a lot of necessary steps that are happening right now really lead to the direction that we're claiming or that is being claimed so far. Thank you, Claude, for, for those comments. And if I could then uh, channel them to, to Lucrezia. Uh, again, Claude uh, spoke about the need to uh, take into account different geographies and different uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, moving uh, to a broader uh, idea of ESG beyond, obviously, uh, climate, uh, taking a long-term view. So if we look at the role of the ISSB and, uh, and the way it's uh, planning its uh, uh, it's standard setting uh, and the role of the system of standards that it will deliver. How do you see it addressing some of these uh, issues? Yeah, let me say, of course, we are at the beginning, but let me say, uh, you know, what is the direction of travel and how the SSB um, and DFRS has already started working on these issues. So first of all, we have prepared in the last two years uh, uh, a prototype, which has been of how the standards will look like. And this has been work that has been done in collaboration with uh, the institution with which we are consolidating, so value reporting foundations, et cetera. 
And uh, so the architecture of the standards will be <coughs> general requirement, <coughs> excuse me, where there will be, you know, the overall sustainability disclosure requirements, the broad ones. Then there will be themes, okay, so climate first, but we will broaden it up uh, after further consultation. This consultation process is very important for our organization because whatever we do has to be legitimized by those consultations. Then we'll have industry uh, standards, so disclosure specific to industries. And, um, you know, all these will impinge on, uh, you know, not only how much emission you have as a company, but also the upstream and downstream. So that is scope one, scope two, and scope three. And, uh, you know, the, the also the effect, um, the, so companies will have to disclose uh, disclose how, you know, the um, adapting to climate change and to the mitigation policy associated to climate change affect the governance, the strategy, the risk management uh, of the company. So we are very much built on ideas uh, of, for example, the Task Force for Climate Disclosure Standard, they see, they see the TCFD, but uh, we, uh, you know, there is already a prototype which is more granular and more prescriptive. So this is uh, the architecture, point one. Point two, the very big challenge in my view will be how to become a truly global standard setter. I mean, we are a global organization, okay? So that's, you know, in that sense, you know, that's important. But, uh, and it's important that uh, this effort will be global because as we know, capital markets uh, are global. But, uh, you know, standards uh, they w to the, extent in which they are adopted, then they will have to be to go through the national adoption process. And uh, so to, you know, and, and this, you know, will very much depends on, uh, you know, the different legal frameworks and, and, and policy uh, and policy, you know, views of different countries. So in, uh, in that sense, you know, what we have proposed, I think it's uh, um, I think it's it's a reasonable concept as so we are proposing to that we will be, uh, our mission will be to design a global baseline, but uh, through various mechanisms in our governance and consultative committees and so on, we will uh, collaborate with national jurisdictions and multilateral organizations to make sure that this global baseline will be coherent to whatever extra requirements countries uh, will uh, have in relationship to their public policy and uh, also to make sure that uh, you know once we issue the standards those standards will become mandatory following uh, you know the national uh, uh, legal and political and policy process so this is a complex uh, journey it's, it's a complex structure and is a difficult journey but uh, in very much, uh, uh, I think uh, the success of it will depend on, on various elements. One is governance, and so these consultative committees and the uh, engagement with jurisdiction, in particular with emerging markets, I think will be very important. Uh, the engagement with the private sector will also be important. And, uh, you know, I also want to stress that we are going to have a multi-location organization so that, uh, uh, you know, we are, uh, so our main board will be in Frankfurt and Montreal, but, uh, you know, we uh, are aiming to have also, uh, you know, technical capabilities in Asia uh, and uh, also in San Francisco uh, and, you know, some cap capability will remain in London. So, uh, you know, through these multi-locations, uh, the consultative committees uh, within our governance uh, and, you know, a proper due process and consultation, uh, uh, you know, strategy, uh, I think that, uh, you know, at least we can start this journey on solid basis. Thank you, Lucrezia. So clearly a, a robust and, and complex approach for what is a, sort of a complex system of, of, uh, of dynamics and, and a play that need to be uh, governed. Uh, Tejinder, if I could turn to you uh, finally for, for this far, final round of, of comments. Um, again, if, I would be grateful if you could comment on, on, on the issue of the global baseline and the role that each jurisdiction will play here, how important it is. Again, we heard uh, uh, Claude again discussing how 
we have other challenges uh, around data and ratings and the, the transparency. And you discussed the, the, the initiative that IOSC is also uh, undertaking in that area. So over to you to uh, to, to close this, uh, this this conversation here on this. Uh, thank you, Gabriele. So I, I think the the issue of how the global baseline is actually adopted across jurisdictions is a crucial one. And I do think that the role that IOSCO can play here can be potentially quite, quite transformative and quite catalytical. Uh, and it's not the first time that we're doing it because, as I mentioned, we've done 20 years ago with the setting up of the IASP on the accounting side. So you've had you know, the, um, in, in terms of the IFRSs themselves, that is something that we did. We endorsed the standards, the, uh, the IASP standards or the IFRSs 20 years ago. And that played a key role in terms of their adoption in different jurisdictions. Now, did they all adopt the same thing? No, they did not. And I think that is also not what is going to happen with the IWSP. So I think it is important that we are realistic in terms of what is happening, but we are also optimistic in terms of what is finally going to happen. And so clearly jurisdictions will be looking to this global baseline and then they will be in accordance, of course, with their priorities, regulatory priorities, national priorities, look to set those regulatory regimes with regard to, to reporting and disclosure that is appropriate for their jurisdiction. But I do think that why do I say optimism then? I say that because the work so far has been very concrete. We have engaged with the prototype. Yes, we have not endorsed it. We are not going to endorse the prototype per se. Uh, but, you know, there is a certain degree of comfort because you've had regulators, IOSCO members saying this. And when I say, you know, the IFRS uh, initiative, the setting up of the IWSP under standards is getting IOSCO support. It is not a small thing. It is not because I sitting here, I'm saying that. It is because there is pretty much unanimity, I would say, across our membership that, as I was saying, covers, you know, 130 you know, plus regulators that together regulate more than 95% of the world's capital markets. That's not a small thing in terms of their comfort with that. So, uh, and therefore on the content side uh, of things, we will continue to engage with the, you know, the, the consultation that will happen and with the standards to be able to confirm whether we can endorse it, similar to what we did 20 years ago. And that, as I said, can be a game changer in terms of jurisdictional adoption. On the content, <laughs> I should also say that we are using the term baseline, but let's not confuse baseline with just basic. It is anything but basic. It is sophisticated. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, that is the work that is happening. And so that will already provide quite a high degree of, uh, of, of that baseline. Yes, that can be supplemented and so on by national jurisdictions. But I have reasonable hopes to say that there will be in, you know, consistency. And the second pillar, uh, is really about due process and governance. Let's not, you know, so content is important, but the trust really in the public happens not just through content, but through due process, through following due process. And I can say that with the IFRS, that is something that they have been also very particular about. We have been in this journey so far, constantly engaged with them through the monitoring board. And I have to say that so far, we have been completely comfortable with the process that has been followed. And that comfort translates to comfort at national level and it translates to the public interest. So I think those are the two things that I would say, content and governance. And, and the last point is just to reiterate the thing that, you know, for many jurisdictions, they will, they are already, you know, they will be looking to have capacity building, regulatory capacity building, apart from other stakeholders. Yes, that's important. You know, we will have to build capacity across the board. But IELSCO engages in regulatory capacity building, and this will be a key priority for us uh, in the next year and, and the years going forward. Uh, together with, and I don't want to, to miss the point that Claude was making and you asked me, which is about the data and, and the work that we are doing on data reporting, on ESG reporting, et cetera. Um, and and that, is also, that will also be part of the capacity building, as will be the aspects about asset managers and their disclosures. So with that, back to you, Gabriel. Thank you, Tejinder, um, and, and thanks everyone. I, I'm not going to attempt to, to have a full summary of what has been a, a very rich discussion, but just to say that it, as a takeaway, it's clear that we are seeing a really uh, increased uh, appetite from all stakeholders in capital markets for 
uh, investing that uh, takes into account ESG factors. Uh, we've seen that in India where uh, there is a growing interest and, and, and companies are keeping themselves. Uh, guidance has been provided um, from, from both stock exchanges and regulations. Um, indeed, we are facing a number of, of key challenges, but the good news is this final like, glo global, global approach to the issue, one that brings transparency, that, bring, that brings rigor and, and robustness. Uh, but it's obviously a long journey and, uh, and it's uh, good to see uh, openness and a willingness to engage all key stakeholders in these uh, across all sectors and geographies. Um, we did, let, let me just uh, close the session. Um, I hope viewers found it useful. On behalf of the World Economic Forum and the Observer Research Foundation, I'd like to thank our uh, guest speakers uh, for, for having engaged in this conversation um, and really wishing everybody a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.